Next part three of our special series on drugs. This one is titled, Cutting the Roots, a further examination of the relationship between foreign drug producers and their American market. Last night, we looked at the Mexican connection. Tonight, we go to the country that has become the major supplier of cocaine to the U.S. and ask just how effective has Washington been at pressuring it and other countries to get out of the drug business. We'll get answers from both the State Department and a congressional critic. But first, a rare look at the thriving cocaine business in the remote mountains of Colombia. The reporter is Colin Blakely of Worldwide Television News. High in the Andes Mountains of southwest Colombia, the Indians have for centuries grown and cultivated these small privet-like trees. They bear no fruit, yet their produce is so sought after that people lose their fortunes and sometimes their lives in pursuit of its beguiling properties. This small leaf is the bottom end of a trail which links the peasant hand picking it to some of the world's most famous and glamorous people. Here on the roof of Latin America is the home of that so-called elegant aristocrat of the drugs world, cocaine. Since glaciers first cut these valleys in prehistoric times, Andean Indians have used the coca leaf to combat the effects of malnutrition and exhaustion. Today, vast tracts of hillside have been cleared to make way for plantations as Western demand for the drug almost outstrips supplies. In this area, controlled by the left-wing guerrilla group M19, the Indian families and their plantations have little to fear from the authorities. Like most communities outside the big cities, their economy is governed by the cocaine dollar. This family's income is made up in part from Colombia's other main export, coffee. But the bulk of their money undoubtedly will come from cocaine. The plantation will be harvested three times a year, and will earn them around $1,000. The cocaine, which comes from their crop, may be worth 500 times that amount. The peasants are aware that what they do is illegal, but the effects of the drug on Western society is something they just cannot grasp. Getting high on coca to them is no different to others chewing gum or tobacco. For the small team which runs the illicit laboratories, making daily inspections of the plantations and organizing deliveries of the coca leaves can be carried out in almost perfect security. The guns of the grillers provide a shield behind which the cocaine industry flourishes. Government troops are loath to venture into the mountains, lending credence to the grillers offer of protection to the drugs trade in return for a slice of the profits. Even the chemicals for the laboratory are picked up in daylight. Under cover of darkness, the process team make their way on foot and by candlelight to the laboratory about one hour's walk away. It's a small shack on the other side of the mountain, close to a guerrilla encampment. The chemist is Alexandro. Known locally as the cooking man, he's the link between the plantation workers, the guerrillas, and the Colombian Mafia a group of a dozen wealthy families who control over 80% of the world's cocaine market. Their wealth is legendary. Each family is said to have access to billions of dollars tucked away in secret accounts in the Bahamas and Switzerland. Not that much filters back here, though it's in small shacks like this, housing a lifestyle virtually unchanged by the passing of time, that Colombia's $2 billion a year black market economy lies. Cocaine is a family business at every level. While the women prepare dinner, the men wait for the first coca leaf delivery to arrive. It comes at midnight. It's taken this farmer five hours to cross the mountains with his load, a journey made more hazardous by the day's heavy rain, which has washed away many of the trails. Ten times a week, the mule trains arrive, bringing in nearly two tons of leaf every seven days. It's a tightly scheduled operation, repeated daily throughout the mountains at dozens of other makeshift laboratories. It is, without doubt, the biggest and most lucrative cottage industry in the world.
Once the leaf has been weighed and the farmer paid, the process begins with the coca being finely chopped. The American government is pouring millions of dollars a year into South America, trying to kill the trade, but with little success. The cocaine dollar corrupts at every stage, be it buying arms for local guerrilla groups or persuading the local police chief that his life expectancy would increase, with considerable comfort, by staying out of the mountains. The Colombian government has been persuaded to ban the importation of chemicals used in the clandestine laboratories, but at this level, the Indians are still producing high-quality cocaine paste ready for export. Ordinary household salt is sprinkled on the leaves to react with the moisture released by the chopping. With the salt evenly mixed with the leaves, the pile will be carefully wrapped up and left for half an hour. In the meantime, it's time to eat. The son of a respectable mountain family, Alexandre has been making cocaine paste every week for the last five years. He says he was sought out by a stranger who told him how to organize plantations locally and then taught how to refine the leaves. In the short time it's been left standing, the leaf has undergone a remarkable change. A black tar-like liquid oozes from it. The leaf seems almost alive as it's transferred to a barrel. <laughs> Under the watchful eye of the cooking man, several gallons of petrol are poured over the leaves. The petrol will act as a solvent, devouring the sticky black fluid in the most risky part of the operation. On occasions, a carelessly discarded cigarette or an untended candle have produced disastrous effects. It's a part of the process which Alexandre stays well away from. After a thorough mixing, the barrel is covered for the night. It'll take another seven hours for the petrol to do its job. The leaves are given a final mixing before being squeezed dry. It's the liquid which contains the cocaine. The leaves will be wrung dry and then thrown away. With the hard work over, the chemist introduces his talents. With no facility for accurate measurement, concentrated sulfuric acid is mixed with water using instinct, guesswork, and like the experienced cooking man he is, by taste. It looks like archaic technology, but it does work. In the last three years, the quality of Colombian cocaine paste has more than doubled. The last step is the addition of a small amount of soda. The sample is now ready for testing. If the cooking man has done his job well, the procedure will be repeated on a much larger scale. A common handkerchief proves an ideal filter. The solution drips through, leaving behind the products of the night's endeavours, cocaine paste. The team are pleased with the result. The more pale the paste, the greater the purity. It doesn't look very much for 10 hours work, but this small mountain shack will produce around 12 pounds of cocaine paste a week. By comparison with some Colombian operations, that's an insignificant amount. But further refinement will give this pound and a half of cocaine paste a London street value of more than 100,000 pounds. In effect, this little hut is ultimately producing a cocaine market of 26 million pounds a year. 26 million pounds is worth close to 41 million dollars. That's just a piece of change in the multi-billion dollar drug trade, which the U.S. has been trying to curb, among other ways, through diplomacy. The man who's been at the center of those efforts is John Thomas, outgoing Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics Matters. Mr. Thomas, how in the world do you make any headway against an operation like that when we just saw in the remote mountain regions of Colombia? Well, it's been difficult. At the same time, you do it through international cooperation. There's no way that we expect uh, any nation to do something like this on their own. And in the case of Colombia, we have been right there with them, providing assistance, technical advice, and in some cases, advisors in the field. Well, would you, I mean, is it easy? Is it difficult? I mean, what, what's it like going up against a, an operation like that, which 
in a way, is very sophisticated. I mean, those men seem to know what they're doing. And very dangerous. Uh, last year, some 200 uh, policemen in Colombia lost their lives. In fact, uh, we have now been engaged in raids in the jungle area of southern Colombia, uh, where a number of uh, national policemen have recently been killed and trying to uproot some of these cocaine laboratories. And in some of these cases, uh, they're not just guarded by a few policemen or a few uh, criminals like you saw here on the film, but rather and guarded by insurgency groups of two to three hundred men. But what do you do about the, the reporter kept referring back to the corruption with the local police, with the government, the, the mafia families and so forth involved uh, down there. Um, how do you deal with that? What do you do? Well, you start, uh, and I'm glad that you showed an episode on Colombia, because I think Colombia demonstrates what a country can do when finally backed into a corner. A few years ago, Colombia was probably considered by most people in the world as the true arch-villain in the narcotics set. Today, based on what the government has done, the political commitment made by the president and throughout, perhaps uh, served as a, serving as a catalyst in part the killing, the assassination of the Minister of Justice a couple of years ago, where the Colombian people said they had enough, and they have sustained a major crackdown throughout Colombia. Last year, 85% of the Marijuana cultivated in Colombia in the primary growing region was eradicated through aerial eradication. You mean it's better now than Much it was? Much better now, absolutely. On the other hand, uh, we're not going to fool anyone by saying that the cocaine problem in Colombia is anywhere near solved. We haven't even really begun. Uh, we're looking at right now at ways where the coca leaf can be sprayed and eradicated, and we're raiding these laboratories in the Llano, so that's the southern area of the Colombian jungle whereby uh, these labs uh, are, are, are located and where these insurgency groups, in fact, are providing the very security for many of these laboratories. How do you keep from getting just extraordinarily uh, frustrated and, and uh, just overwhelmed by the, the enormity of the task you're talking about here? Well, I think one of the positive things that we've seen is this change of attitude on the part of many governments. A few years ago, many governments really didn't seem to care. Today they are, for maybe two reasons. One. Uh, governments like Colombia are seeing drug abuse of their own countries uh, increase dramatically. Uh, one of the substances you saw in that film, the coca paste, which has a lot of impurities left in it, is, is smoked by young people in Colombia. It's called basuco, and it has horrible impact with all the impurities left in it. Another reason is that the narcotics traffickers have become so strong, so powerful in many cases, the corruption and the capability that they have to buy influence, in some cases radio stations uh, or television stations, that they began to threaten the very institutions of the government. And when you begin to threaten the national security of a country, then you begin to tap into the reserves of a nation. And I think that's what we've seen in Colombia. Mr. Thomas, stay with us. Robin? We hear another view now from Congressman Charles Rangel, Democrat of New York and Chairman of the House Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control. Congressman Rangel has proposed legislation to cut off international aid to countries not participating effectively in drug eradication programs. Congressman, first of all, how ha well has the U.S.-backed eradication program been working, in your view, in countries like Colombia? Well, it's had some effect in the area of marijuana eradication, but it's been a, a terrible failure in, in other countries. Uh, John Thomas has been a, a, a very strong and dedicated public service, but I, servant, but I think it does a disservice to allow the American people to believe that we have any type of handle uh, on this very serious problem. And I think that this program ought to be lauded for at least bringing it to the nation's attention. Is, is, do you put that uh, at the blame of the government's concerned or failures in the U.S. effort? Well, let me put it this way. We don't have a U.S. strategy. Now, with all of the agreements and the acknowledgments by heads of government that, uh, that uh, growing and producing and processing uh, drugs could have an adverse effect on their governments and their people, the truth remains that we expect bumper crops from every opium and cocaine producing country. So we don't really have a strategy in order to effectively make certain that there's eradication. We can talk about Colombia. They have had their ambassadors, uh, their uh, public servants assassinated. They can't even have a trial of narcotic agents in a civil court in Colombia. All of them have to be tried by the military. The Minister of Justice was assassinated. The President appoints someone to investigate that. They assassinate them. The government is dependent 
on this illegal crop. I know of no eradication that's taking place now in Colombia as relates to cocoa, but the fact is we expect to come into the United States uh, some 150 tons of coca and uh, some 60,000 tons of marijuana and some 12,000 tons of heroin. And I'm saying that the the United Nations, the Secretary of State, and the Congress knows this, and we don't have an effective strategy. What is your strategy? My strategy is, first of all, we have to tell these countries that we mean business. We can't call their loans and have them uh, go into bankruptcy and at the same time give them money uh, for a, a crop eradication program only to find out uh, that corruption has taken the money and we find no eradication. Secondly, I think we should have really a stepped-up law enforcement effort. You go to our local and state police departments around this country, as our committee has, and they have thrown up their hands. They believe it's an international problem. The president and this administration believes that law enforcement and education and prevention and rehabilitation is a local and state problem. But the most important thing, and this is what the purpose your program is serving, is that we have no federal program to deal with education and prevention. We have no mod modality to give to the local and state schools, and they don't have it either. Okay, now we're going to, we have many other programs in this series, and we're going to come to those elements, but what about your proposal? Explain briefly how your proposal would work to force these countries to eradicate by denying them aid. First of all, it's not And let me to preface work. it by saying, don't they make so much money out of drugs that losing a bit of American aid would be small by comparison? No, I have to agree with the secretary that uh, the leaders of some of these countries in Peru and, and in Bolivia and in Colombia really want to excise the degree of corruption that exists in their countries and would really like to have an effective eradication program. But what I'm telling them, what the Congress is saying, it's a message that we're sending to the State Department. We can't have these people in striped pants say that every country that's violating international and bilateral treaties, that everything is working out, they see the problem, we're turning the corner, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and yet on the streets in every congressional district, we see tons of poison still coming across our borders. Oh. What we are saying is, if you take the United States dollars and you take it for an eradication program, at least show the Congress what you've done oh. and make the president certified. You don't do it, you can't do it, you don't get the money. Okay. Judy? All right, Mr. Uh, Thomas, you're not wearing striped pants, but we'll ask you anyway because I think that's who he's talking about. He's saying that, that you people uh, at the State Department are too optimistic that your program's really been a terrible failure when you look at uh, these drug-producing countries all over the world. Well, first of all, as uh, Congressman Rangel knows, in our annual report to Congress, we did not really exhibit any optimism at all. I think it was a very realistic report. And much of the statistics he draws on, of course, comes from that very report that we uh, have shown, unfortunately, that narcotics production is up around the world. We have seen some real success stories, and we've seen some failures, and we've been quite frank about that. I would also like to add that I know of no government where that represents a country where narcotics is either produced or trafficked in, in large quantities, where we have not made that one of our highest foreign policy priorities whether it be President Reagan or Vice President Bush or Secretary of State or myself, I can assure you that these are always issues at the top of our agenda. Mr. Rangel? Since 1972, and this has nothing to do with this administration, any administration, some of the best people that uh, go in the State Department understand the problem uh, so well that uh, I don't think that America gets a fair shake out of it. But we've had laws on the book which gives the president discretion in cutting off economic and military assistance to countries. The only president that effectively used it was former President Nixon. And when he cut off military assistance to Turkey, they banned the opium crops. All right, why not talk about, why not start cutting off mil assistance, military and otherwise, when these countries don't do everything we expect them to do? Well, first of all, most of the assistance is already conditioned to how a country performs in the narcotics area, and we're quite prepared to cut off assistance if we think that would benefit uh, that program. Have For we punished a country yet uh, on no, that basis? No, no. Well, let's take Colombia, the, the case that uh, you've shown tonight. I can assure you that the Colombian government's activities and, and sustained uh, effort in this area was not brought about either because we threatened uh, uh, cut off of assistance or we bullied the Colombians. We made sure that they had the capabilities of carrying out their own functions. They recognized the need to do it with their own country. And where in some countries, 
perhaps, where a government is not doing what it should do or refuses to do so, as was the case in 1980-81 in the Garcia Mesa regime in Bolivia. Yes, indeed. We, we suspended assistance to that government. And is that enough, do you think? It certainly wasn't effective then. And in the case of Bolivia, where, where Congress is now considering suspension of assistance if certain conditions aren't met, uh, it's a government that's already impoverished, and I'm afraid that by suspending uh, small amounts of assistance to that government, uh, we're only pushing them into the arms of the narcotics traffickers. I may agree with him on that. I may agree with him on, on Bolivia. that. On Bolivia. I mean, it's a bad case in terms of their economy. But the truth of the matter is that every country that we got agreements with are producing bumper crops. And I don't recall in the history uh, of, of this administration or the Carter administration them ever recommending a cutback and economic assistance to these countries. There's always some excuse that they're going to do better. And so that is why the Congress got involved in something that really should be an executive decision. But they've never recommended saying that this country, you take Mexico, we got more heroin pouring across our borders from Mexico than ever in the history uh, of their production. But you're saying we haven't used, we haven't used any leverage against uh, Mexico. We have never done it because State Department type of people and ambassadors don't do that. All right, let's ask. Why, why yeah. haven't we? Well, first of all, to maybe counter some of the statistics, in fact, uh, heroin coming from Mexico is much reduced to where it was in the mid-1970s before we started our State Department run eradication effort. In Thailand, we expect a decrease this year. Burma, we expect a decrease. Pakistan, we expect a decrease. Colombia, we've just talked about some of the successes. So the bumper crop uh, description really is not completely you may accurate. You be expecting it, Mr. Secretary, but what I'm suggesting is every year of this administration, we've had dramatic increases in marijuana, cocaine, and opium. Is that true? No, it's not. And, and for example, in, in Colombia, we've seen significant reductions in marijuana cultivation in this year. Uh, coca cultivation, where there has been manual eradication operations, uh, we are now working on the spray I was talking about. The coca problem is probably our biggest difficulty right now because it's not only grown in remote areas, but uh, w we're, we're talking about cooperation in governments where there may not be full cooperation. What more would you have them do? He's saying that the, that the output is going down from these countries. What more? The would first you thing have... I would want him to do is not to believe that the State Department can possibly deal with this problem alone. You have to have a national strategy. You have to deal with demand. You have to make certain that kids and adults recognize what is going on here. You have to have effective law enforcement. You have to do something to protect your borders. And you have to make certain that in the foreign policy, it's not just the assistant secretary that's dealing with, with sanctions and, 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 uh, and, and offering the carrot for eradication, but also the foreign policy, the debt restructuring, so that when the Congress looks at whether or not we should provide sanction and drugs, that we're not crippling a country that's already unable to pay its international debt what responsibilities. That? What about that? Well, first of all, there is a national strategy, and Congressman Rangel just described it, whether, whether he'll admit it or not. Uh, our strategy starts with international cooperation, then it's tough interdiction at our borders, then it's good enforcement inside of our country. All three of those things have been increased, then in the de into the demand reduction area. And you're saying that's working. And I'm saying it's a long-term strategy, and anyone that would sit anywhere and say that we can s expect short-term results in this area is just flat-out wrong. It's a long-term well, strategy, and it's going to have to have a time. 17, is that what you expect? A 17 billion dollar educational program federally. Only three minute, million of that is allocated in dealing with the drug problem. We have no effective program to deal with uh, demand in this country. And well, that, that and is name it because uh, we don't know about it in New York, Chicago, uh, Boston, all of the places that we've had if hearings. There has there's been, been a, no let program. me just ask you this yes, finally, Mr. Thomas. If there has been a decrease, why haven't people like Congressman Rangel seen it? Well, he, they, he has seen it in specific in our countries. Streets? In specific countries, we've seen decreases in, in production. On the other hand, I agree with Congressman Rangel, who has been an outstanding champion in this area, that we have not seen a decrease in worldwide production. And in fact, unfortunately, we've seen an increase in drug abuse around the world, an increase in political instability because of the drug problem. Well. And uh, that's an unfortunate circumstance. It's good to hear you end on one at least brief note of, of harmony. Thank you both, Mr. Secretary Thomas and Congressman Rangel. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you.